And Sam is the first university that I've ever heard of that decided to take all the collections and put them under one umbrella in one facility. If you go to A&M or UT or any other big university, the collections are under different little baronies. It's like a feudal system in Europe 500 years ago. Professor is told, you're the new herpetologist. You have five years to get tenure. You need to make publications, teach your classes, do outreach and get some graduate students. Oh, and you're supposed to be over the snake collection. All the herps in jars. Well, of course, those get neglected typically. Plus, through the 90s, science moved on from these 19th century sciences. Genetics, molecular biology, things moved on. And the collections got orphaned a lot. Budgets went down. Very sad story, 95 till about 2005. But the happy ending is that eventually people figured out they've got to have the resources to do the molecular biology. They've got to have the collection. So at one point, Sam decided in about 2012, 2014, to concentrate on organismal biology, training people to be uh, park rangers, Texas Parks and Wildlife, you know, things like that. And we've done a very good success. In fact, yesterday, Friday, no, Thursday morning, one of my students, I had to, I had to give him a, a letter of recommend, a call of recommendation. Any of you in this Walker, Montgomery counties might have interacted with Dan Jones, the Parks and Wildlife biologist. Well, Dan announced he's going to retire. And if things go right, our student who comes out of this facility will be the new one. So this facility is full of all the collections of the university, but it's not about things. You'll see our little board there. It says who works here. We take the students in. For example, we take the ecology class and as part of ecology, they have to do a lab here. They're forced to come in here and draw things and do these little lab exercises. We give them a talk and every time there are about seven sections of that class, it takes all week. But there are two or three or four of those students who say, hey, I really like this, that's cool. They have an opportunity to volunteer, build their resume. They can put in, I was a curating assistant in the birds or something. About once a year, a professor comes in the door from the campus, frantic. <laughs> I need help. I just got a grant for, you know, $100,000 to study the hummingbirds or something. Do you know anybody that we could hire? I'm like, oh yeah. Well, how about, you know, Amelia? She's up there, we're volunteering. So there's a good story, Amelia volunteering. She came in on the ecology class, volunteered, ended up working on a state grant for monarchs, studying the milkweed plants, had to go to the Mercer Arboretum and meet uh, Tiller. Is it Anita Tiller? Yeah, Anita. Ended up volunteering down there. And as far as I know, Amelia works down there. But we're an engine. We're not about things. We're an engine to pull their resume and push them out so they've got a fighting chance against the, the Harvard people who are like, you know, they show up at the interview and they're like, here's my resume. It says Harvard. And they're supposed to expect everything to fall down in front of them, right? But our Sam student, like Kelsey, shows up. She's got a grant, publication. She's given a presentation. She blows them away. Now, our young lady, Kelsey, is at Yale. We're very proud of her. And I could go on and on, but you don't have time to hear about all of our 
success stories with these students. Been here two years in this building. So I'll try to run through a lot of the questions that you asked. The building is 1930 High School for Huntsville, built by a famous architect who built all the schools in Houston. David Addicts bought it when it was going to be bulldozed in 2017. He's like, no, no, no. I went to school there in 1943. You're not bulldozing my school. It's David Addicts, the man who built the big Sam Houston statue, right? You've seen that? And several other big statues. And you all think David Addicts is like the big statue guy? But he's not. He just started doing that when he was old. <laughs> David went to school here in the class of 43, graduated, you know, messed around a couple of years and ended up by 1948, he's in Paris studying with like Picasso and all these people. And so this was David Addict's gallery from 27 to 2017. Then the university bought it from David who said he wasn't going to be able to handle it anymore. And, uh, University renovated it and put all the collections in one place. So that's kind of a nutshell of our story. I can tell you if this facility of about 40,000 square feet was on campus, 0.8 miles away, it would cost, see these little tiles here? Those would cost 430 something dollars. 400 and something dollars square foot. You know those tiles were square foot, right? Here, Buying the entire city block, new roof, new wiring, everything new. About 45, and if you really want to be liberal and count some other things, maybe $50 a square foot. So we're very proud to say that by doing this in this way, we're serving the university. We're in a, in a way that no other university is doing right now. We're saving the state buckets of money enough to pay when we say, well, we need, you know, so, some new cabinets. Well, we have a big balance sheet on one side and that $450 square foot to $40 square foot. See what I mean? So we're doing a good, responsible fiscal job. A lot of people will come by and they'd say, why are you restoring that old building? Y'all ought to just blow those. No, we have very good financial reasons why it was smart. And we do a magic here. There's a magic that occurs when we take the entomologists and archaeologists and the, all the different kinds of biologists and put them in the same room, like a high pressure reactor. We tell you lots of stories about people who are like, hey, how does that work? Well, I'm an entomologist and it works this way. Like, Whoa, we never thought of that. Yeah, it's, it's a magic that occurs when the, the people are meeting who at AM. The entomologist would be two miles away in a building. Somebody else would be in another building. They'd never meet. So that's what we do. And also, I'd like to welcome you home because you are at home. You're Texas Master Naturalists. And I was at AM in the 90s when they had this idea hey, let's make this Texas Master Naturalist thing. And they went around and got professors to, to write chapters. They were like, hey, Dr. So-and-so, you're the most illustrious person in the, in the field here, Dr. Dixon. Why don't you write a chapter on herpetology? Okay. When they came to entomology, the old prestigious professor was Dr. Horace Burke. And Dr. Burke was the entomologist over the collection. But he also liked natural history. Horace Burke is training me, he's training my director here, Jerry Cook, and Horace was writing about the history of natural history. Horace would go and track down the literature. If some Horace Haldeman came to Texas on some army expedition in 1830 or 50-something, Horace would track down everything about this guy and build a file on he would look at the genealogy and figure out who their great grandkids were and track them down. And he was like, the one thing I remember, he tracked down Horace Haldeman, this army entomologist, tracked down his descendants, and they were like, oh yeah, we still have Papa's like 
he had this writing desk that you could take on a horse out west. We got that. We got all these glass negatives. He would track down all this crazy stuff. We like to say he was like the Stasi of biology in Texas. You know the Stasi in East Germany. They have a file on everybody. So Horace was the entomologist there. He wrote that chapter, but he didn't want to write entomology. He wanted to write the chapter on natural history. And if you look in your book, you'll see it. And since we're all family, we can tell some stories, right? I can tell you that Horace wrote that chapter. Different people wrote chapters in your handbook. And Horace was about 89, 88. And they decided to redo the chapter. And they hired someone to help, a historian. And Horace flipped his lid. He was like, I can't even repeat what he said, but it was just like <laughs> blankety blank blank. I wrote that chapter, and that's my work, and you're not going to change it. And they said, Look, it's just too long, Dr. Burke. It's just too much. We can't print it all. We have to edit it down and he was like blankety blank blank no in fact i'm taking my blankety blank chapter and leave it and I, is it still in the handbook i don't know there's a chapter Check. on it it probably still says morris on there but part of what we do is we save all these papers so when you go and write a book like that we have archives when you write a book, you get all of the material and you get it organized. So we have all of his handwritten notes, exploring for Persia in Chiapas, Mexico. This is for another book he wrote. If you understand about, this is about naturalists and their travels in Mexico. Whoops. Anyway, Part of our mission is we say we have Horace's library, which is one of the finest libraries on natural history exploration in the United States. I can tell you that Horace donated it here. We set up the Horaceburg Library, which is down at the end of the hall as an endowment. It's going to be there permanently, independently. And I would have to go to his house and pick up more books after he donated. And he would tell me, now listen here, because I was his student and he could talk to me that way. You listen here. You be damn careful with these books. This box of books are the only copies in North America. And I'll be like, how do you know that, Horace? <laughs> because I get the rare book catalog from the book dealer. And I look up each book in World Cap. And it tells me that there's a copy in the New York Public Library, the Library of Congress, and the LA County Museum. And I'm like, you don't get that one. And if I look it up, and there are no copies in North America, then I buy it. Price is no object. I'm retired. I don't have anything else to do. I'll just buy it. So that brilliant man set up his library and put it here in Huntsville. So that if you are a scholar and you have to look up certain references on like Audubon or I don't know what you're working on and you look up all the references you need and you get ready to make your notebooks and get all your materials and study them to write your book. And then you figure out where are all the references and you start making a map and a, a list. You're like, well, let's see. This year I need to go to Newark Public Library and next year I need to go to Miami University. And what is the most efficient way that, and there is no way to work it out so you don't have to go to, they're like, Huntsville, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> and he had the engineer, and that's here. About 4,000 volumes of natural history. Another thing we do is leverage. You give me your library of natural history, I don't just take it and say, Oh, we got the library done. No, no, no. We take the library 
And then we go talk to the other people who do that. So some of you might know Stan Casto. He's like the greatest, oldest living natural history expert, like the history of natural history. He writes little papers about like George so-and-so, egg collector of South Texas in 1880s. He's really detailed little <laughs> papers. Well, Stan was like, I don't know what to do with all my papers and notes and piles. I'm like, well, you know, it would really be good if they were put in the same place with horses. So we did that. Some of you go to the Houston Museum of Natural Science, We're run by Raymond Neck in the 90s. All Raymond's papers and files are here. And part of the thing is we go around and we, we rescue and accumulate <coughs> collections of books, papers. If you're into herbs, like last summer, we took in the, all the papers of three major herpetologists, Roger Conant, Ernie Liner, and I forget the other one. So we take in these papers. We have all the papers of David Riskin, who was at Parks and Wildlife for many years. So these are a resource. Why do I fixate on these papers and documents? Because you guys are special. You might want projects you might want to get involved in. We have like all the papers and notebooks of A.S. Jackson, who was a biologist in the Panhandle of Texas in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. File cabinets full of little notebooks where it's everyday detailed notes. We have notes of people who recorded. I have a file of a guy who recorded all the monarchs flying through Houston. What direction they were going, how many, what was the weather. In the 60s and 70s, before they even knew the way they were going and migrating. We have this rich, rich pile of data, specimens, and things that you could be using as master naturalists. Now, what is your history here? Um, I'm talking a little bit too long about it, but it's important. I told you about Horus. Well, let's just start from the beginning. Entomology in Texas started in the 1890s when the bull weevil came. And the legislature said, oh, man, we need to get some smart guys to study these bull <laughs> This is the problem. So they built a team, rented a house, went to work with, like, their horses and buggies and, you know, 1890s equipment. A&M was created in when? 1870s? something. AM got the entomology department. That entomology department one of the first entomologists there was VA Little. Dr. Little wrote one of the first books on entomology in Texas. General and Applied Entomology, Professor Emeritus, Texas AM University. Dr. Little trained Horace Burke. So you're, do you know about your like academic lineage? You can say that by taking what is essentially a class today for me, you can say that you learned something from me about entomology. Well, I learned what I'm telling you from that Dr. Horace Burke. And that Dr. Horace Burke learned this stuff from VA Little. We have, we have the very first insect cabinet that A&M ever bought. 1903 is here. When they started doing outreach in the 1890s, they didn't have PowerPoint. Then what, how do you do it? You have to go to a town and talk to farmers and tell them what to do about the bowl label. <laughs> they hired an artist. An artist would paint a picture of a bowl weevil. And they'd frame it and have this big frame. And instead of this thing, he'd stand up here and be like, Howdy, y'all. Here's our presentation on the bowl wheel. Well, we've got that thing. It's down there hanging on the wall. And it's just a kind of crude looking picture. But 
in the archives, we have a photograph of the house and the guys are all sitting at their desk with their hats on and all this like old timey picture. And in the back in the corner, you can see the artist guy and you can see his easel and he was busy painting these things. So we have that. We have a huge project on entomology because A&M kept archives on entomology like this. And we have cabinets and cabinets full of this where they would pay someone to go through and keep the correspondence. This just came in two months ago because somebody at A&M was like, we need to clean out this laboratory. What are we going to do? Throw all this stuff away. And you know, in every organization, there's one person, maybe a few, who were like, oh, well, we can't do that. That's a terrible mistake. That guy's an asshole. Don't do that. <laughs> That's what they say. They're like, we got to throw everything away. So we get calls. I get a call. I could hurry. I was like, hey, honey, I won't be home tonight. I got to go to AM. <laughs> I gotta go get some, some stuff. Okay. And so we have these collections that haven't even been looked at. <clears throat> Here's like, I have your letter of September 10th in reply, sending you a separate report of the entomologist printed from Nebraska for 1909, pages, blah, blah, blah. And there's all their correspondence, all their little, little documents. Anytime somebody would call and say like, hey, we got this thing eating our crops over here in Quero, I'd send a guy out there and they'll make a, they would make a report. You know, Farmer Johnson in Quero has this kind of a bug eating his crops. Wireworms attacking corn at College Station, 4-15-29. Small field planted by the Division of Entomology, et cetera, et cetera. We need somebody to scan all of these things, they need to be saved. But we run around and, and we save these. If I spent a week scanning these things and making PDFs and trying to serve them, that's a week I wouldn't spend getting the other collection from someone else. So this is kind of what we do. I want to point out that I'll finish this history stuff by telling you that we also keep all their books. So we have an incredible library of things, and we also pay a lot of attention to provenance. So here's Tori Bueno, Grocery of Entomology. This is an awesome book that you've got to have. But we also have March 1974, Sammy Merritt. Sammy was, she was the curator of the collection at AM in the 60s and 70s. So we make sure that we keep Sammy's book. And if we have three copies of this, we don't really care. We keep them all. But we pay attention to things called marginalia. Sometimes in here, Sammy might write, oh, these people are completely crazy. This is wrong. <laughs> or I saw one of these in, in like College Station. Those marginalia we take care of too. We've trained lots of people. I taught entomology labs at A&M. 10 years, the orders of insects that you want to hear about in a moment. That was a course that took two semesters. So you would spend an entire academic year with me learning how to identify every family, not orders, every family. You know, Monday, Tuesday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, all day. Every university in the country that had an entomology department had this big long course on how to know all the bugs. Even AM has bumped that down to one semester now. So there's not any such thing anymore. There's not. If you want to learn all about insects, you can go to an entomology department, take one semester course, but pretty much you're on your own. I got, I got this hood, and I'll finish with this. Do you all know what this is? A hood, when you get your PhD, you get hooded. And um, they put it on you. This, this is really neat. Van Allen Little, 
B.A. Little received the first Ph.D. in entomology at A&M in 1943. And when he received the Ph.D., he got this. This was the hood they used. So this was used to hood the first Texas entomologist, doctor. And then 1959, Forrest got his Ph.D. and Dr. Little gave it to him. And then I was Dr. Burke's last graduate student. And he told me, someday, I'm going to give you that hood. <laughs> but he didn't. <laughs> and he gave us the library, and we worked on stuff until he was 89. We had his 90th birthday party here. In April, by November, he was dead. But it was OK, because he was 90. He like had this great life. He has a library named after him. And I had to go help clean out his house and his kids were there. And they were like, what do we do with this? But oh my God, he's got lots of junk in here. What are we gonna do with this? And I was like, uh, Horace said that I could have that when he died. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, sure. So I came here and it, now it's at the museum here. And we don't know what's gonna happen to it next. Be a long, long time before it moves around again. So there. Do you have any questions about entomology? Or that history stuff? So you know that. Oh, I didn't quite explain. I ended up writing the chapter on entomology as a graduate student. It was all these big professors, and I wrote the chapter on entomology because Horace wanted to write the chapter on on the history. He's like, "Well, you go do it." He's like, "All right." And that's why I did that. So, if you want to know something about the orders of insects, the great diversity of insects, yes, is that what you want to talk about next? Well, maybe 20 minutes I can cover it. <laughs> so it was a whole year before, a class of a year. And you know, we'll do it in like 20 minutes, we'll talk about it. Which means there ain't no way that you'll understand enough. That's the first point. If you want to study entomology, you got to be completely dedicated to it. Or specialize. Yeah, you can specialize. We work with specialists a lot. We do survey projects where we go out for the army, for instance, they want to know what's on an army base. We go and survey everything out there for like a year, write a big report, what species are present there and what's their significance. And we have to work with experts. We work with Brian Raber. Brian runs an oil company in Fort Worth. But he's the Texas expert on carabid beetles. So here's a guy who's writing revisions and naming species, detailed work, but he runs an oil company. The guy who does longhorn wood borers for us, Dan Heffern, we make him an associate of the museum, but Dan is a pipeline engineer in Houston. We have a collection of praying mantises. Yen Saw is an engineer in Houston who collects praying mantises. We have a giant collection of freshwater mussels of the world. Don Barkley did that. He's an air traffic controller, which is a pretty good job. The bottom line is, if you want to be a specialist in insects, perhaps you ought to think about going to be a banker or an engineer <laughs> or something where you're wealthy enough to take off and go do these things. We tell the students this. We should we tell you this. It's remarkable that probably the vast amount of entomology is done by people who are avocational, like yourself, choosing to focus on one small group that really excites them, like dragonflies. The professors are in meetings all day with students, creating papers, busy, busy, busy. 
the world expert in Bodine scarab beetles, is a banker from Genoa in Italy. These people with resources. So you need resources, you need time, you need to specialize. This is not a big insect collection. This is tiny, and we have over a million specimens upstairs. There are how many orders? Al gave us a talk about the King Philip came over for a good stay, right? So we're talking about the ordinal level of diversity. King, kingdom. What kingdom are you in? Animalia. Animalia. Plant kingdom. There used to be Monera, which was the bacteria. It's all different now. There's very difficult now. Kingdom. What phylum are you in? Cordata. Cordata. You're in there with the sharks, and fishes, and the amphioxus, all the things that have a notochord. <coughs> Gee, we've got to talk about these big, broad things first. Do you understand where your heart is? Where is your heart? It's right here, right? And then what's the other side of your heart that way? Your backbone. If I shoot you with an arrow, ching, and I'm dead on. It goes right through your heart, and then it sticks in your backbone, right? You're dead. So your heart's in the front, which is not really the front because you're standing up on your hind legs. Your heart's on the bottom. Where's the bug's heart? It's in the back. If you ever dissect an insect, the heart is in the back. So you're in chordata with a noto cord. What does noto mean? It means top. So you're exactly reversed from the insect. So we figured out some things about your phylum. Team, phylum. I still have to do it. You know that? I still have to, have to count on my fingers and toes. I'm forgetting everything. King, phyla, C, came. Class. What class are you? Come on, high school teacher. Save us. Mammals? Mammals? Mammalian. Yeah. yeah. Hair, milk, endothermy. No are mammals. What about the bugs? Well, they used to call it class insecta, or sometimes they call it class hexapoda. So mammals are on the same level as bugs. We skip phylum. What phylum are the bugs in? Arthropoda. Sorry, I got too fast. I just skipped the arthropoda. What does the arthropoda mean? What is arthro? What's arthritis? Any of you have arthritis? Yeah. Inflammation of the joints. Itis is an infection or an inflammation. We do this all the time with the students. We're like, have you had Latin? No. Well, you're not going to be able to understand anything we're talking about. <laughs> well, I don't. And then we're like, yeah, you know Latin. No, I don't. I never had it. Yeah, you do. You know it. Trust me. You know a lot of it. You don't even know you know it. Arthro is joints. Itis is an inflammation. You get like, what's another itis? Bursitis. I don't know what your bursa is. <laughs> it's the lining of the muscles, right? So we got arthropoda. And it's class insecta. Are there any other classes in the arthropoda that you know of? The other big one, arachnida. And then what's the difference between arachnids and insects? Legs. Yeah, legs. The insects are six legs. The arachnids are eight. Unless it's a nymph. You know, a nymph, a young, young tick or mite, they got six legs. So here's the good point. Don't go thinking you know everything when you know one little factoid. 
because there's always going to be some exception. So we got Canum, Phylum Arthropoda, Class Insecta or Hexapoda, King Phylum Cane. Oh, order. What order are you in? Primates. Yeah. Right? So you are in the same order with the gorilla and the marmoset. When we talk about order, we have you got primates, artiodactyls, carnivores, you know, all these different orders of the mammals. Well, the insects, class insecta has about 30 orders. It's a lot. He told you about one order, Odonata. The orders almost always end in a certain ending. Do you know what it is? Owls, bugs are not following the rules. Odonata. All the orders, most of them, end in Optera. What's a pterodactyl? The flying dinosaur thing? Tarot, it's wing. So if we look through the table of contents, Coleoptera, Lepidoptera, Orthoptera, Neuroptera. The orders all end in Optera. How convenient. Once you know that, then you know a little Latin, you can figure these out. Should we just go through them real quickly? We don't have time to really dissect each one. And you just wanted to talk about the biggies, right? Odonata, you heard about that today. Orthoptera, grasshoppers, crickets. What does ortho mean? Um, it means right, like orthography. When they're like, in the old days, they would be like, well, you know, you're a part of the establishment and you've written this history of Texas that is sort of like all about the Texas Rangers and the heroes, and this certain story. A really intellectual person would have said, oh, well, you've written an, an orthography, which is like, you wrote the right story, the straight, the correct one, instead of what we hear nowadays is we're getting different interpretations, right? Ortho means right. And those grasshopper wings stick out to the right. Orthoptera. Mantids. Okay. Isoptera. Iso means what? What's an isosceles triangle? All sides equal. Iso is equal. What are isometric exercises? You're like, I'm gonna do, is that right? Is that an isometric exercise? Yeah, instead of like, I'm gonna go run. That's not isometric. Isometric is like, I'm gonna do this for 10 minutes. <laughs> the same, <laughs> equal pressure, right? Isoptera, same wing. These are the termites. You catch a termite, and it still has its wings on. You've seen these emergencies where thousands of them are flying. Mm -hmm. You get their little wings and look at them. And it's like the front wing and the back wing, they're exactly identical. Dermaptera is a small one. Embiaptera is a small one. Uh, Plecoptera, that's kind of important. And I don't really know what it means, pleco. I think it means folded. Plecoptera are the stoneflies, but they're, they're a small order. You said you wanted the big, important ones. Socoptera, Zoraptera is very small. Thysanoptera, the, the thrips. All right, here's another big order that doesn't, 
kind of confusing. I want to talk to you for a moment about Hemiptera and Homoptera. Do you know what these orders are? Anybody? Not yet. We're not there. The true bugs. Hemi means what? Don't say carburetor. <laughs> Usually in the class, some guy's like, who's on a, a dodge? <laughs> a hemi. No, hemi means half, like northern hemisphere. Half wing. And if you look at a, a true bug, like a stink bug or one of those big giant water bugs, mm -hmm. you'll notice if you unfold their wing, the wing is like leathery. And then the apical half is membranous with veins. And you're like, that's weird. The wing is like half. And when they fold up, they fold up across like this. And the leathery parts sort of meet and form a shell-like thing. And the membranous parts are protected under there and getting worn out. So it's sort of a half wing, hemiptera. There's another important thing about hemiptera, the true bugs. Most of them have a piercing, sucking mouth part. If you see those guys on your tomato plant, or in some kind of a hemipteran in your crops, and you want to go put some seven dust on them, what's going to happen? They're going to be like, what's this stuff? <laughs> <laughs> They're not going to eat it. Seven dust is for somebody with mandibles who's chewing your plant, eating that dust, and then they're sick and dead. The hemipteran's like poking through and sucking the juice out. Or maybe they're biting a caterpillar or something and sucking the juice out. Or maybe they're the triatoma one living in your house. Or maybe they're the bed bug in your bed, in your filthy, filthy motel, <laughs> living in the mattress. And when you go to sleep, you're crawling out of the mattress and crawling and biting you and taking blood. And you wake up and you're like, Oh, oh. oh, I have spots all over me. That's hemiptera. And they have pierced and sucked your blood. Every one of your little cliff swallow nests. You go under the bridge and watch the barn swallows or what are they? Yeah, you when the when we had to make collections, we're like, you need 18 orders. You need this many families. The students would be like, uh. Oh, how do we get Simicidae, the family of the bed bugs? And you're like, look, y'all get you a long pole and you go out to the bridge and you poke one of those nests on. Somebody catch it in a net, bring it back to the lab, and it's just teeming with bed bugs that suck the juice out of the baby swallows. Yeah. That's Hemiptera. Very closely allied to homoptera. What does homo mean? Like homogenized milk. What's that? It's not all separated in cream. It's all homogenized. We are homosexual, like two people of the same sex. Homo is the same. Hetero is different. What is homoptera? The same way. Wait a minute, you told me that isoptera was the same wing. I'm confused. Yeah, it gets confusing. The homoptera are the sucking bugs that have a wing that's all the same. Think of the cicada. It also pierces and sucks the juice out of the roots. Doesn't have to have wings. It could be like the aphid on your plants, piercing and sucking. These two orders have gone like this. They're like a couple that can't decide if they're going to break up or get a divorce. Well, let's try again. You know, over the years, like when I was in college, oh, there's Hemiptera Homoptera. When I came here and worked for a few years, I said, oh, Hemiptera Homoptera. And somebody younger said, oh, no, no, you are way out of date, Dr. Godwin. Those orders are 
confused, the same. And I was like, man, I'm old. They actually, I outlived an order. <laughs> <laughs> but I got even older. And then I was talking about that. And somebody was like, oh, Dr. Godwin, you are so out of date. The hemitra and homotra are separate again. It's like, God, I can't keep up. <laughs> so I don't know what to tell you about those two. Sometimes they're together and sometimes they're not. <clears throat> Next is coleoptera. The beetles. Coleos is a sheath. Something to do with like sticking your sword into a sheath. It's a protective covering. Yeah. The beetles have got, we didn't mention that these bugs all have four wings, right? Front wings and hind wings. You know what, butterflies, right? That's easy, dragonflies. In the beetles, the front wing has evolved into a hard shell. But the hind wings are membranous. And if the beetle wants to fly, have you ever watched a beetle take off? If you catch a beetle and let it walk on your hand, they will often crawl to the highest point and stop. And if you watch them for a while, and then you, you can even poke them a little bit, those wings will open up. And the hind wings will unfold and it'll, and it'll fly away. It's like, how in the world does that thing fly? It's like a car flying. <laughs> but he does. The Coleoptera, the beetles, one of the biggest groups. You know, JBS Haldane, the famous evolutionary biologist, was asked, What do you know about beetles one time? You know this story? And he said, all I know about beetles is that God had an inordinate fondness for beetles because he made so many of them. Which was a, there's a, be a book now called An Inordinate Fondness for Beetles, all about them. It's a famous quotation. There are more weevils, one of the families of beetles, there are more weevils than almost any other group. Strepsiptera, you'll never hear about them. Mecoptera, the scorpion flies, you'll be lucky if you see some. Next one, neuroptera. What's a neuro? What's neurology? Nerve nerves. The people who started that, they didn't know what nerves were. They dissected us so of cadaver and they're like, there are these funny cords. Neuro is a cord. That's the cord wings, 26. No, order 26, page 370. Alder flies, dogs and flies, fish flies, snake flies, lace wings. You've all seen green lace wings. Ant lions, you might know. Or any of you, did any of you catch doodle bugs when you were a kid? You get the stick and put it in the ant lion thing in the sand and turn it around and say, doodle bug, doodle bug. Did y'all do that? <laughs> and it comes out. The neuroptera have four membranous wings with a great many cross veins. They look kind of like damsel flies a little bit, except between the front wing vein, like the leading vein, which would be along here, this one, between the leading vein and the second vein, there are lots of little jail bars of veins. It looks like little jail bars, or kind of like a smile, the teeth, and they have lots of little cross veins. Let me make an aside real quick and tell you, when we teach these groups, we can teach you the name and we can teach you, we, they're like a skillet. A skillet 
as a handle. Every group has a handle. There'd be like the one thing you look for on it. So if you think you know the name of a bug or a group, you think you're smart. But do you know why it's that thing? Then you're smarter. You know that, oh, that's a sarcophagid fly. And people are like, how do you know that's family sarcophagidae? It just like buzzed by your head. Oh, because they have a red butt. The end, the tip end of the abdomen is red. You know when the fly goes by, what's that? Oh, that was a California. It's, it's, uh, how do you know that? Because it's metallic. And once you know these little handles on the different groups, then you're like, twice as smart, you know, you know the handle, but you're still dumb. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> the person who's really smart will show you the metallic house block. They'll be like, all right, class, today's the, today's the exam. And do you ever take a lab practical? And you're like, all right, next station. And you're like, uh, 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 uh. oh yeah, that's a metallic fly. California. And the professor's like, hmm, hmm, that the metallic house fly X. So you learn the little handles, but beware, you're a lot like Mickey Mouse when he got the wizard's wand. Remember that movie? What was that called? Yeah. And he was like, man, I'm a wizard now. But he completely made a big mess, didn't he? <laughs> so once you get the handle, realize that they don't always work. There will be exceptions. So what I can do now is give you the name, the background of it so it's memorable, and then a little handle. But in a way, I'm, I have to, this is like the warning on the medicine. You know, you know the handle is dangerous. Use with care. Order trichoptera. Trichos are hairs, hairy wings. These are the caddis flies, the ones that the fly fishermen like to mimic. They're aquatic things. They have a tiny moss like adult. Now we're getting some good ones. Lepidoptera. Anybody know that one? Yeah. What is a lepido? Julius Caesar would have gone with his like coat of chain mail to the guy and be like, ipso facto lorum, blah, 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 blah lepidums. And they'd be like, see, some of the, somebody shot an arrow at me and some of my little le scales on this are gone. Lepidos, lepidos, scaly wings. You've all rubbed the dust off the fly wings, right? Mm -hmm. Tiny little scales all over the wing. Butterflies and moths. Next one's easy and giant. Diptera. What does die mean? Die two. What's a die thing like? Dichromatic or bipolar. Dipolar. Diatomic. Diatomic. Diptera, two wings. This one's easy. All the flies have got two wings, not four. There's some flies that look just like wasps. They even sound like wasps, but the fly has the front wings for flying, much the same way that Howard Hughes and his friends in aviation in the 1920s were like, these pipelines are cool, but they're like really slow. We need, we need like a monoplane with a bigger motor. We could build a thing, we'll call it a Spitfire. You know, we can make a fighter that goes back. Diptera did this a long time ago. And flies are like the F-16. They're like, look, we're gonna get rid of this biplane thing. We're gonna take this other wing and we're gonna shrink it down. So there's like big wings for flying 
and you can go fast, you can like zoom. You've tried to squat a quad before, right? You know, like you just can't get the darn thing. And the fly can fly and land on the ceiling. The bee fly parasitizes things in the ground. The bee fly can fly by the hole in the ground and lay an egg so it goes. They're like super precise flyers, acrobats. But in order to do this, you got to have a timing thing. So the hind wing has shrunk up to where it's basically a ball on a stick. And if you look at a fly, you look nice hind wing, front wings, and the hind wings are called haltiers. And they're keeping time while he's flying. They're like little gyroscopes. That's the diptera, a huge group. And you can make money with the diptera. If you notice that the thing has two wings and not four, and your buddies are there and you're like, hey, give me another beer, sure thing. Look at that watch. Yeah, ooh, that's a bad one. I'll bet you $5 I can catch it and hold it in my hand. <laughs> and they'll be like, no way. <laughs> and you hold it and it's like, ooh, ooh, ooh. I've seen people do this. And the, the guys are like, Paula, oh, how did you do that? And they let it go and it flies away. Because <laughs> they knew that it is a fly and not a wasp. And then they got to five bucks. <laughs> they do that with carpenter bees too. You know about carpenter bees? Oh, the order Hymenoptera. What is a hymen? Well, he talked about King Philip and all that. I could talk about a hymen. Here. We're all scientists. A hymen is a membrane. Membrane is a hymen. So they call it the membrane wings. These are the bees, wasps, ants, and sawflies with membranous wings that have a hook. One of the main things about bees and wasps is that they have wings. They have to solve this problem of being agile. The flies did it by producing to one wing. Yes? And having a halt here. The wasps are like, this is like the Russians and the Americans trying to fight. How we've got to design a better supersonic missile or something. We've got to design it better. The wasps do it by a thing called hand mealy. The hind wing has got rows of little hooks that hook onto the front wing, essentially making it one wing. So they can, a wasp is very agile also. So hand mealy, if you look up hand mealy on your phone, you'll see a microscope picture of a wing, and it's got all these little crochet hooks coming out. And they're actually hooking over the vein on the next one. And you can take the wasp wings and you can unhook this. And you can have one wing like this, one wing like that. But by and large, they stay hooked together. And that, that gets us to the end. The, the bees, the ants, and wasps, they are the most advanced order. Name one characteristic of the bees and the ants and the wasps that makes them different. One characteristic makes you different from all the monkeys and apes. Sociality. Yeah. Beetles don't live in families. Oh, well, there is one. There's one beetle that lives in little families. Red cockaded woodpeckers live in little families. But that trait of having a social structure is the most advanced in the hymenoptera. Ants have a colony. Wasps have a paper wasp nest and they're all living together, cooperating. One of the, when I told you you have a handle on understanding things, I would give you rich, rich, rich examples of morphological and shapes and colors and things. 
there's a whole other world of genetic handles. The one I want to finish talking to you about here is haplodiploid expressed in the wasps and ants, the order hymenoptera. If you get together with your husband or your wife, you make a baby, and she has an egg, and she has what? Two X's? Two sex chromosomes, right? Yeah. I got that right? I'm glad we have a high school uh, teacher to keep me straight. And the male makes a bunch of sperms, and some of them have got X's, some of them have got Y's, right? So there's roughly a 50 50 chance you're gonna have a boy or a girl. That's the normal way throughout most of the animal kingdom. But ants, bees, and wasps have haplodiploid. It's different. The females have got two sex chromosomes, they're diploid. But if the egg is not fertilized and it's haploid, that makes a male. So it means, and I always have to look this up, but it means that within a colony of ants or bees, let's see, you share like half of your DNA with your brother or sister, right? Theoretically, they share three quarters. If they share, and you know that they're all the ants in the colony are sisters, right? Did you know that? Yeah, they're all sisters. So in like the little movie, like Ant World, or what was that? And had the little ant dude, and he was running around. Remember that movie? That was, what was it called? Yeah. Ant Farm. Yeah, back in the 90s, it came out, and me and all the entomologists, we were like, well, that's a very interesting movie, but they got it all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you know, try to tell your girlfriend this or something like that. Oh, yeah, this is a nerd. <laughs> you tell her this. Well, of course, because half will dip away, and by that time the date's over. <laughs> <laughs> they're all females and they're all sisters. And since they have such a greater genetic affinity, this is one of the reasons why we think that social behavior and those those adaptations have evolved while we have ant colonies. We don't have any solitary ants. Wasps, they're all in. Bees are in a hive with a queen. See what I mean? That sociality has evolved because of haplodiploid. In a very similar way that some people say humans are the one primate that has evolved this. Well, their others are social. Those Chimpanzees and gorillas, we're finding out they're very social, but but we've really taken it to the extreme. I mean, they don't have a master naturalist group of chimpanzee guys, <laughs> or a, a plumber or a lawyer. One of the theories is that we've taken this to its extreme because we have language in which we're actually sharing information and becoming more like each other. It's not just our genes to reproduce ourselves. In a way, we're doing reproduction now. In a way, Dr. Little, who wrote this book, is like the grandpa. And Dr. Burke, who wrote that book, is like, well, he's like the great grandpa. And he's like the father. And then the ideas as they're transferred down, probably something I told you today, this little book, Dr. Little said one time at AM. With actually, with that chalkboard, which is kind of funny, mm -hmm. that's the chalkboard they used. Mm -hmm. And it went down to Horace Burke, who repeated it later, and then told me it, and I repeated it. And maybe there's something I said today that you will repeat to someone else, like something about the wing or something you learned, one little thing. And in a way, that's reproduction because there's genetic information that's been passed along. But now we're passing along other information. We're sharing more information through language. And hence we have sociality. And that's what's so cool about these, these 
Hymenoptera, and that's why they're the last order in the in the list. So that kind of ties it up, a whole year of stuff. And of course, all these families, you'd have to learn like 30 families of beetles. One last thing to tell you, and I'll quit. You understand about Romans, cowboys, let's see, you understand like woolly mammoths, Romans, cowboys, and like us. You understand that, right? You're like, oh yeah, woolly mammoths are thousands of years ago. Romans, the march. You understand this, this broad spectrum of history, right? The bugs have one like this. You need to understand that. A good handle is the Permian. Do you know that Texas has the Permian Basin? Do you know what the Permian means? It's a geological era about 230 million years ago. You've heard about the Permian before. You know that the Permian was the big, big extinction in that, right? You know that before the Permian, there was things like the Carboniferous, where there were like big dragonflies, right? You know, so you know that bugs go back way before into the coal age, almost to the beginning. We don't know how far back they go. And you know that there was a big extinction in the Permian and that everything survived and flourished into the dinosaurs. You kind of got this framework in your mind. All of these orders that we talked about originate from the Permian. They're basically the survivors who barely got through. You know how the dinosaurs all went extinct, but the birds made it? And now it's like birds all over the place? Beetles right now, for instance, have almost all got something on 11 antennal segments. Bugs all have two wings. By and large. But if you get back to the Permian, beetles have 14 antennal segments. Whoa. And there are some bugs with six wings. So it was like a whole galaxy of insects. And it got nuked when the world went snowball in the Permian. And then they all recovered. And everything you look at basically originates as like the survivors of that big extinction. And of all the groups of insects, there are the primitive ones, which have no metamorphosis. And then they're the ones with the primitive metamorphosis, like a grasshopper, where they get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And then there are the holometabolism ones, which have egg, larva, pupa, and adult, right? So now you know, like, kind of a broad spectrum of where the bugs come from, how far back they go, you understand how they survive a big event, much like birds survive an event. You understand that there are three groups of bugs based on how did they grow. And you understand that there are about 30 orders. And that's about all you could cover in one day, really. Do you have any questions? <laughs> what you need to do now is, well, let me, let me say this. When, when, when we finish, you're going to scatter. So we're going to go eat lunch. The rest of you welcome to stay all day long if you want. There are some entomologists coming this afternoon who want to come and go collecting out in the National Forest. So I have to meet them. So don't worry about keeping me. I'll be here. You can go to your collection, library, archives. Mammals and birds. Upstairs is entomology, paleontology, herbarium with plant specimen back to 1849. Invertebrates, which includes collections of freshwater mussels, snails of Texas. Um, there's a collection of silks. The silks come out of a caterpillar. 
and they make silk out of insects. Uh, so yeah, you can spread out. Had a question? You were gonna tell us about the carpenter bee. Oh yeah. Those old, old guys would be like, that's a white face bee. White face bee won't sting you. You know, a lot of those older natives, they have that stigma that, that what's that spot? And the males have the spot and the females don't. On those carpenter bees, the male carpenter bee has got a white patch on his face. So a lot of those guys would be like, it's five dollars. I can catch that bee and hold it in my hand. <laughs> they would know that it's the white faced bee and it's the male. Much like those uh, cicada killers, you know, those bad looking big wasps. There was one in our front yard and it would patrol the front porch back and forth, back and forth. And if you walk out on the front porch, that thing is like. And it's looking at you and buzzes around you. Have you done this, seen this? And my wife was like, You've got to kill that thing. It's going to sting me. I'm like, No, honey, that's the male, and they don't have a stinger. The males of the hymenoptera don't sting. Well, I want you to kill it. But I, no, I'm not going to kill it because there's no way I've got a PhD in entomology. <laughs> <laughs> well, it scares me because it's not going to sting you, it's just checking you out. <laughs> so, remember, the males don't sting. The stinger is a modified opiate positor, actually. Any more questions? Thank you. You're welcome. Right. Thank you. Yes. What's your favorite order? Well, I I'm supposed to specialize on the scarab beetle, the dung beetle. Yeah. I don't have time for it lately, but the tiny dung beetles, the photias. I recently got invited to go to Thailand. Mm. This super super mega billionaire guy was like a jewel collector. Decided that he was going to collect amber from Burma. And he was like, I'm going to buy this, this piece of amber. He would buy the entire production of a mine. He would go to the mine out in the middle of nowhere and he'd be like, he'd show up. And he said, when I show up at the mine, the miners all get up out of their hole and they come to see you and they're going to kill you and take your car and all your stuff. And he would show up with his armed guards. So they would come and his guards would go, hi, we're here to talk about Amber. And then they would say, oh, you need to meet the head guy. And he would he'd go and see the head guy and the head guy's like, all right, what do you want? You're about to buy some Amber? Yeah, I want to buy the Amber. Yeah, okay, well, I'll sell you some Amber. And he said, the head guy's like, I'll sell him some crap because my main guy is like general so-and-so. This is bad, bad people. And he said, he looks at the guy and he says, yes, I want to buy some amber. In fact, I want to buy hmm, your entire year's production. And the guy's like, oh yeah. Uh, and he's thinking, I got to call the general, tell him something happened. I'm not going to have any amber. <laughs> and he buys the whole collection. And he invited a bunch of us to go to Thailand and look at all of this amber. Pile of it cabinets full of it and we're supposed to look through and like oh this is the fly this is wasp this is all these I think it's all these bugs in the amber and I was looking through there and I was like oh my god this is a dung beetle wait a minute hundred million year old amber with like dinosaurs and things and there's a dung beetle when we get back and we'll do some research like look wait a minute there's no dung beetles known from the dinosaur time. There's some little scratches in the dirt where they think a dung beetle buried some food. But we've got this dung beetle. And like, it's like perfect in amber. It's like you caught it. 
We're working on that. And I'm, that's what my specialty is, the dung beetle. But this little dung beetle, it's not a normal dung beetle. It's a kind that only eats mammal dung. So we could go out here in Texas and catch them that look just like it, very similar, that are in like rat nests and gopher nests and things. So the guy was all excited. He was like, oh, wow, you mean the dung beetle that eats the dung of the dinosaurs? That's amazing. And they're like, no, 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 no. It's even more amazing. <laughs> this dung beetle eats the little rat turds, the little pellets, not like a big old pile of manure. This one eats the, it's the little one, and it eats the little pellets of the mammal. You've got the mammal, the little mammal that was running around under the dinosaurs. And that was even cooler. Yeah. So that's, I specialize on beetles and mainly scarabs, but the tiny ones. I have probably 10 or 15 new species of scarab beetles here in Texas that need to be described. Don't go thinking that everything is done. There are new beetles, like big scarabs, within 80 miles of here that you could go discover. I've got one, I don't even know what genus it's in. Here in Texas, if you head over to the big thicket, you know everybody talks about the, the, the thicket of diversity and how it's a refuge and all these rare plants and things. The bugs are doing that too. And there are areas over near like Burkeville, Tyler County. There are areas near the Louisiana border that have not been explored at all. <laughs> Any more questions? Was the guy Jay King? Which guy? The guy that bought the mine. His name is. No. No. He's a Swedish guy. It's a name I, I have to. I can't even pronounce it. He's the gemologist, the world expert on emeralds. He showed us emeralds that Angelina Jolie was sent to have appraised. Uh, Swanky. <laughs> if you can get involved in these things, I mean, we're here, we're like, you want to get involved in it? Cool. Go tell you what you like. Oh, that's 